Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the conclusion of our week 15 series overlooking or looking over the uh, history of Christianity and transitions in Christianity since the 1960s. This is part of our course on the 2000 year history of Christianity, which is the serves as the introduction for our uh, certificate in Christian studies in the fall of 2022 here in the Religious Studies Department at Florida International University in Miami, Florida. I'm Professor Joseph Holbrook. Today we will look at new kinds of churches that emerged in the last quarter of the 20th century, and then we'll finish up with the Protestant debates over the ordination of women. So let us jump into this. This is our outline. We've covered most of it already, but at the bottom you see highlighted cultural change, new forms of churches, and the Protestant debate over women's ordination. So, in the uh, era, era after 1960s, after the crazy and wild 1960s, which I lived through, by the way, uh, some people began to doubt whether the traditional Protestant denominations were capable of coping with new developments in the American society. Yet American Protestantism rose to the challenge and developed new approaches to church life and ministry congruent with the cultural mood. New ways of being church emerged, adapted to the needs of specific groups of people. And so this brings us to our first picture, which is Chuck Smith. He was a pastor in California, the pastor of a small church called Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel Fellowship of Churches presently consists of a network of about a thousand congregations and traces its roots back to 1965 when Smith was began to pastor the uh, small church of that name in Costa Mesa, California. Calvary Chapel made it clear that it did not wish to be seen as a denomination, but rather as a fellowship of churches. Where traditional denominations establish churches in areas using a corporatist model of branches or offices of the central organization, Calvary Chapel's approach is more of a franchise which avoids the financial and organizational overheads of traditional denominations. And this is John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Christian Fellowship and the Vineyard Fellowship of Churches. A similar model was used by John Wimber and the Vineyard Movement, which currently has over 1,500 affiliated churches. This church, uh, this church movement originated in Anaheim, California, and is particularly associated with the ministry of John Wimber. The Vineyard Movement grew out of the Calvary Chapel Network out of a concern that Calvary did not give sufficient attention to the role of spiritual gifts. The Charismatic Movement was becoming a significant presence in California in the 1970s, and Wimber had been involved in its development, teaching a controversial course at Fuller Theological Seminary called Signs and Wonders in the Kingdom of God. Once more, the Vineyard Movement does not regard itself as a denomination, but as an association or fellowship or a network of churches. It has no centralized structures or authority figures. I attended uh, one of John Wimber's uh, workshops back in the uh, 1970s, maybe it was the early 1980s, and uh, there was a clear, um, clear charismatic element or Pentecostal element to his uh, workshops, but it was done in kind of a clinical classroom fashion, inviting the Holy Spirit to come and inviting the, the gifts of the Spirit to manifest and uh, a focus on healing, divine healing, as well as other kinds of spiritual gifts. I'm sorry. I'm ex forgive me about that. I'm expecting a phone call from my doctor, so I had to look at it. So um, I attended that, and this made a huge impact. 
especially in the charismatic movement of that time and those who were neo-pentecostals so this brings us to another another uh entrepreneurial leader named bill hybels who was the founder of willow creek the willow creek community church and he also was the pioneer of something called a uh, uh, seeker sensitive movement this was a movement that focused on on uh, reaching so uh, the seeker sensitive movement turned the sunday morning service into a highly choreographed kind of professional presentation and uh, aimed at uh, non-believers non-church attenders people who did not identify themselves as christians and uh, bill hybels and his church pioneered this with uh, very slick presentations uh, great music and then uh, good advertising to bring in people uh, to their sunday morning service so the sunday morning service is no longer for believers for worship, it was for the evangelization or the proclamation of the good news to the lost. And uh, that had some unfortunate uh, side effects, in my opinion, but uh, I will forego further comment on that. So this, this phenomenon of uh, secret sensitive and networks of churches and vineyard and Calvary Chapel all of them have something in common, which is the idea of a community church, which allows the entre entrepreneurial personality to develop their gifts in ways that would be impossible within the confining and restricting structures of most traditional denominations. These churches are strongly sensitive to the needs of their local communities, possessing a local grounding and knowledge which informs their strategies and agendas. And that will bring us to uh, one more example of one of these um, types of churches, which is uh, Rick Warren, who is the uh, founder of the Saddleback Community Church in Mission Viejo, California. Uh, this is one of the most celebrated recent examples of a community church was established in Saddleback Valley in Orange County, California in 1980 by Rick Warren and his wife Kay, who had just graduated from Southern, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Texas. It aimed to reach out to those who did not traditionally attend church in a way that was seeker sensitive. Uh, on the other hand, it was also maintained a theologically conservative uh, emphasis. The vision was to establish a place where the hurting, depressed, and the frustrated and the confused can find love, acceptance, help, hope, forgiveness, and guidance and encouragement. So most of these uh, the, most of these um, new church movements coincided with an emphasis on church growth and the rise of the mega church. The mega church was usually in excess of two thousand members, and uh, many people predicted that mega churches were the uh, church of the future. Some suggest that a major transformation of the religious life of the United States is underway in which the megachurches are in effect becoming the new dioceses. Uh, with large numbers of orbit, orbiting congregation or house churches in their, uh, in their orbit. Uh, some would say that megachurches are more responsive to social changes, easier to manage and cheaper to run than traditional denominations. A little bit like how Walmart is cheaper to run and more efficient than small mom and pop grocery stores. And Barnes and Nobles was uh, cheaper to run and easier to manage than small niche uh, bookstores. Uh, of course, Amazon came along and pretty much uh, beat Barnes and Nobles at its own game. So there's a congruency here between uh, the shape of Christian churches with trends in secular society, especially in, in the economic sphere. But the author goes on to point out that the great medieval monasteries planted smaller monasteries or daughter houses in outlying re regions, resourced by the mother church until they were deemed strong enough to be self-sufficient so the megachurches are in the process of spreading. 
the future of Protestant denominations in America may well be deeply shaped by this major new trend. I just want to add to the author's comments here. I'm glad he puts the, a positive spin on it. However, uh, with every new innovation, there always comes uh, unexpected and unintended consequences. And that was true of the medieval monasteries, and it's also true of the megachurch movement. So there are there is some criticism of the megachurch movement of the uh, of a dumbing down of the discipleship process of the loss of a sense of intimate community. Uh, however, it's easy to criticize when uh, you're not successful. So time will tell what will happen to these various new church movements and the megachurch movement. Uh, one more thing we want to discuss today is the issue of ordination of women. So this has become a significant debate in the Protestant circles, not so much in the Orthodox or Catholic church, churches who tend to hew to a, a line of tradition more closely than Protestant churches. But among Protestants, there's a debate about uh, whether women should be ordained to the ministry or not. And there are numerous Protestant denominations that have uh, started ordaining women uh, to the ministry, even back in during 1948 for the uh, Lutheran, some of the Lutheran churches, uh, Anglicans or Episcopals in uh, this country have been ordaining women. If you look at uh, Protestant evangelical history, all the way back to uh, the Moravians, uh, ordained women to ministry in the early 1700s. And so there is, uh, there is a precedent for this among Protestants, but there are other uh, Protestant groups that are strongly resisting the idea of ordaining women to uh, leadership positions based on certain passages from Paul in the New Testament. Um, and so early Christianity came to the view that they were that all were one in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, whether male or female, whether master or slave, differences of race, gender, or social position were declared to place no obstacles between all believers sharing the common faith. But this did not resolve the issue of leadership. The term ordination is generally used to refer to the process by which someone is formally admitted to a position of leadership within churches, roles such as pastor, priest, or a minister. There are three main arguments that are used against uh, the ordination of women uh, in some of the leading Christian communities. The first is that the New Testament appears to limit leadership roles to males. At one point, Paul seems to declare that he does not permit women to be teachers in 1 Timothy 2, 12, and argues that they should be silent. Uh, I've heard a number of rebuttals to those passages or interpretations that put them in a cultural context. Nevertheless, that is one of the main ob objections of some of the more conservative and traditional circles within Protestantism. The second is that the tradition of the church is to have male leaders and that to do otherwise would be to break the tradition. A response to that is that that uh, tradition of the church was a cultural accommodation to the surrounding patriarchal societies, beginning, of course, with the Roman, the Roman culture. The third is that Christ was male and gathered around him male apostles. This makes it clear that those who act as Christ's representatives uh, must also be male. And so why Protestantism? Why is this debate in Protestantism and not in other Christian traditions? Catholicism and Orthodoxy both are regarded, uh, regard tradition as being of defining importance in this matter, and they did never initiated this discussion on the extension of leadership to women. Yet Protestant denominations in North America and Europe came to believe that the time was right for a view of both the cultural situation within which Christian ministry was embedded and the theological arguments relating to the ordination of women. So some responses to the earlier three objections that I mentioned. Uh, one response on the first one is that the New Testament is not as specific on the question of women's ordination 
as has previously been previously been thought. Paul's injunctions are often local and personal, occasional, and are not to be taken as universally binding. Plus, the New Testament already depicts women in ministry roles within the circles of Jesus and within early Christian communities. Take a look at Paul's uh, chapter 16 of Romans, written by Paul and all of his female colleagues and co-workers. So the second response, reply to the uh, objection about tradition is that tradition is something that is living and capable of growth and adaptation. It does not mean the uncritical repetition of past conventions or behavioral norms. And third, uh, the fact that Christ was male, Christ indeed was male, and his mission was partly to break down the older religious views, including the nature of leadership. Christ's circle included many women, many of whom were sent out in a pastoral or apostolic role. One example would be when he, uh, uh, when he commanded uh, Mary to go to his disciples, his apostles, and tell them that he was risen. She was sent with a mission. Other arguments in favor of women uh, in ministry, uh, one of them is theological, that ordination was about discernment of God-given gifts and a communal authorization authorization to use these within Christian churches. Did not women have such gifts? We all know women who are highly gifted in leadership, in prayer, in biblical study. Uh, should not these be recognized and used in public ministry? The second is political. The issue of women's ministry was an equality issue. Both male and female ought to be allowed to carry out the same role, same roles in today's society. And so that brings us to the conclusion of our week 15 overview of uh, changes since the 1960s. Uh, next week, week 16, we'll talk a little bit about some global trends of Christianity, uh, talk about the worldwide Pentecostalism, and we will finally conclude our 16-week series of 2,000 years of Christian history and uh, move on to other courses that I will be teaching in the near future. Thank you so much again for your kind attention and uh, your interest. As always, please feel free to reach out to me to find out more about our Certificate of Christian Studies. It is available to people who are at some are outside of Florida. Uh, it's available to FIU students, but it also can be taken by people who can sign up as non-degree seeking students. So let me know if you're interested in that. Take care. Goodbye. Have a good weekend, and I'll be with you again next week.